With the introduction of Intel's 12th generation Alder Lake processors, they incorporated smaller efficient cores on the CPU die, known as E-Cores. The main purpose of these E-Cores was to help boost multi-core performance for productivity applications. However, the general consensus for these E-Cores has been that they don't provide any benefit to the user when it comes to gaming performance, and I've heard some people say they turn them off completely. So, I decided I'd test my 13700K with E-Cores disabled and then enabled to see what kind of impacts it would have on gaming performance. I think the results here will surprise you. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today, we're going to be taking a look at some gaming benchmarks which I conducted using my i7-13700K test system to see if eCores can have any positive or maybe a negative impact on your gaming performance. Ever since Intel introduced their big little core design to the mainstream desktop, there's been a debate amongst the PC gamer crowd where if you want the best gaming experience from your 12th or 13th gen Intel CPU, you should disable the e-cores as they provide no benefit to your gaming performance. If you look at Intel's own marketing and documentation on the e-cores, a lot of their focus surrounding this hybrid architecture has been on productivity and multitasking. With e-cores, your multi-core performance is significantly improved, which should be helpful in tasks such as video editing, rendering, or running these kinds of tasks in the background as you work on other projects, providing the capability to multitask seamlessly. Games on the other hand benefit from higher clocks, so they're much better off utilizing the larger P cores. They also aren't as heavily multi-threaded as a video editing application, so they don't need to rely on higher multi-core performance. This is why a lot of folks suggest that disabling E cores altogether could actually benefit your gaming performance, since then the scheduler could work more efficiently. This then prompted me to benchmark 40 games to see if this was actually the case, and the reason why I decided to benchmark such a wide variety of games, as opposed to a or 10 games is because it just gives us more data to work with. If I had only chosen 10 games and it turned out that they all behaved similarly, I would come to the conclusion that e-cores aren't worth it, where there may actually be 10 other games out there that do benefit from e-cores. With 40 games, we get the opportunity to look at all sorts of different games out there that are optimized differently and perhaps show different behavior when it comes to interacting with the e-cores. I think that should give you guys a good background on what the purpose of this video is, so let's move on to the test system specifications. For the CPU, we have an i7-13700K which I have overclocked all of its P cores to 5.5 GHz, with the E cores overclocked to 4.5 GHz, and the ring clock at 4.9 GHz. The CPU is cooled by an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 AIO that has 6 fans for a push-pull configuration. The system is using 32GB of Patriot Viper Venom DDR5 memory, which I have overclocked to 6800 mega transfers with tuned timings. The motherboard is an MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi. For our storage, we've got a Corsair MP600 Pro LPX 4TB Gen 4 NVMe. The GPU is an MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio, which I have also overclocked in MSI Afterburner. I've got a plus 200 offset to its core and plus 1700 to its memory, allowing it to run comfortably at 3 GHz and 24 gigabits per second for the memory. Powering all the components is an EVGA 1000 G3 power supply. The operating system we'll be testing with is Windows 11 Pro as it has optimizations for Intel's thread director to effectively use the scheduler. I also tested at 1080p since we're testing CPU performance here. Most of the games were tested using an ultra quality preset, but some games such as esports titles were used with competitive or lower settings since that is what would typically be chosen to represent a more real world scenario. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's jump into these gaming benchmarks. For our first game, we have Hogwarts Legacy, a new title that was released earlier this month and seems to be quite popular. I tested in the town of Hogsmeade, which seems to be one of the most demanding areas in the game. Here we can see that our average FPS doesn't seem to change much with the e-cores enabled or disabled. It's within margin of error. We do see a considerable loss though in our 1% lows with the e-cores disabled. An 11% difference or a loss of 9 FPS. This game seems to have stuttering issues, and I did notice that the stuttering was more profound with the E-Cores disabled. Next up, we have A Plague Tale Requiem. 
Not a whole lot to say here, we're seeing the same performance when it comes to the average FPS. 1% lows did decrease, but it was by a small margin of just 4%. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered is up next, and please note I did not test this game with ray tracing enabled. In this game we can see we get a 5% bump when using the 13700K with E-Cores enabled, and our 1% lows see larger difference at 12%, which is what will make the biggest impact to your gaming experience. So far it seems like gaming performance is in favor of E-Cores. Cores enabled. Returnal is another new title which I've added to my benchmark suite. This is a game which was a PS5 exclusive and was recently ported over. All I can say here is that it seems to be a pretty good port. I didn't have any complaints about its performance and we can also see here that whether you leave the E cores enabled or disabled it really makes no difference at all so let's move on. Death Stranding is a game which has a 240 FPS cap and we can see that for both configurations the system has no problem reaching that limit. However the reason why I still wanted to highlight this game is because we can see that there was a staggering bump in performance when it comes to our 1% lows, 15% which is something I wasn't expecting. This is important because while having a high average FPS is good, what's more important in my opinion is the consistency of the frame times. If you have performance with large swings in regards to your frame times, then it's not going to be as smooth as the average FPS may imply. Microsoft Flight Simulator is another game where we see similar average FPS between both configurations, but 1% lows see a major impact when we have E-Cores disabled. We're talking about a 28% difference, which makes the experience with E-Cores enabled a lot more consistent and smoother. Total War Warhammer 3 is another game which really surprised me as I was not expecting these kinds of results. With our E-Cores enabled, we attained an average FPS of 263 and 199 for our 1% lows, meanwhile with e cores disabled, we see performance drop to 250 FPS average, which is not a huge loss, but 149 for the 1% lows. That's a 5% and 34% difference respectively. Again, it all just comes down to consistency. I don't care about average FPS as much at this point, especially when we're talking about well over 200 FPS in a game like this, but 1% lows are what matter more, and with a difference of 50 FPS, yeah, that's going to have a serious impact on your overall gaming performance. Up next we have Gears 5 and we see this game also benefits from having our E-Cores enabled. We can see that there is an uplift of around 9% for both the average FPS and 1% lows. That's not bad, it's performance I definitely wouldn't want to miss out on had I chosen to blindly turn off E-Cores. Here's a blast from the past, Middle Earth Shadow of War. It's a game which I haven't tested in quite some time, but I decided to include in my list of 40, though I didn't expect I'd be picking it out when talking about performance with E-Cores. With E-Cores enabled, we see that performance jumps by 10% for our average FPS, and 13% for the 1% lows, which is pretty good. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is a game that I find to be pretty well threaded, and that's evident here. With the E-Cores enabled, overall performance is better, and we see modest gains for the average FPS and 1% lows, an improvement of 7% and 9% respectively. The next game we're going to be taking a look at is the Rift Breaker, and here we see performance going in the opposite direction. In this case we see performance is better with E-Cores disabled. Disabling them yields a performance uplift of 5% for the average FPS and 6% for the 1% lows. Up next we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and this is another title where we see average FPS doesn't improve by a whole lot or not really a meaningful margin. It's the 1% lows which see a double digit performance gain at 14% allowing for a smoother experience. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition is a game which shows a similar behavior like what we saw in Rift Breaker. Performance is considerably better with E-Cores disabled, average FPS is 11% higher, and 1% lows are also better by 10%. Moving on, and we have Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 2022. And in this title we can see performance improves when we have E-Cores enabled, but I wouldn't call it a huge margin, still I know how people in a game like this are after every frame they can get, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Here we see 6% faster performance for the average FPS, and 8% for the 1% lows. CSGO is another competitive FPS title in our benchmark suite, and I'm honestly somewhat baffled by the results here. This game is so commonly thrown around as just being a very single core heavy game. I thought whether the E-Cores were enabled or disabled, performance probably wouldn't be affected. With that said, we can see that clearly this game performs better with the E-Cores enabled. However, at this point, it's really just an EP measuring contest. Either configuration would offer you a stellar performance experience. And Witcher 3, using the next gen update, while our average FPS doesn't really change at all, we can see that we get an 8% uplift when it comes to the 1% lows, which again is another game which adds on to the list of why you should just be 
leaving your e-cores enabled. In Ghost Recon Breakpoint, when we have e-cores enabled, it provides us with the best performance results versus disabling the e-cores, at 13% improvement for the average FPS and 12% for the 1% lows. Again, it's a no-brainer, keep the e-cores on at this point. For Honor is another title which is fairly old at this point and I haven't tested in quite some time. Not even sure how many people still play this game, but nonetheless, testing it gave us some very interesting results to look at. Our average FPS sees a minor improvement of 3%. I mean, for this game, we're talking about north of 550 FPS. It's a pretty overkill. However, where we see a massive difference is the 1% lows. We're talking about a difference of over 100 FPS. I ran the benchmarks over six times for each configuration, double checked the settings because I wanted to be absolutely sure there wasn't something else causing the performance difference, but all that was changed was me disabling the e-cores. I honestly was not expecting that. The last game we're going to be taking a look at is Far Cry 6, and it's another title which shows us why having e-cores enabled is better for your experience. We're looking at a 12% improvement for the average FPS and 24% for the 1% lows, resulting in some considerable performance increases. Alright, so now it's time to take a look at our 40 game average. With the results we just saw and taking into account the averages seen here, e-cores do definitely benefit your gaming performance. Our average FPS improves by 2% overall, and our 1% lows, which in this case I value as more important, improved by 6%. While those margins may not seem like a lot, it's important to remember you need to take a look at things on a game by game basis. As we just saw, there were many which showed significantly better performance with the e-cores enabled rather than having them disabled. However, for the games where we saw performance regression, there weren't that many titles that showed a significant loss. Most of them, the differences were pretty minor and the performance losses therefore didn't outweigh the benefit. The average FPS figures across all the titles was relatively close and there wasn't too much variation which is what I was expecting anyways. However, when it comes to frame times and 1% low performance, this is where we saw many games show larger double digit performance differences. And again, there were more titles that showed better performance as opposed to less performance and even when there was performance loss, again, it just wasn't that big. So if you have an Intel 12th gen or 13th gen CPU that has e-cores and you are wondering if you should disable them for better gaming performance, I would advise against it. You're not only going to leave performance on the table when it comes to gaming, but you will also cut a large portion from your multi-threading performance. I personally just can't see any reason for disabling them after going through these results. Also, the other reason for that is you've paid all this money for this piece of hardware. Sure, you're free to use it how you please, but don't you want to be taking full advantage of its capabilities and get your money's worth? Unless you're absolutely sure that the game or application you use on a daily basis is better without e-cores, then you don't have anything to be worried about. Anyways, I was glad I decided to run these benchmarks and test all these games. I honestly wasn't going into this expecting there to be a large difference. I was really expecting it to be a big waste of time and I would be staring at margin of error results, but honestly, I was quite surprised. I take it Intel has probably been working with Microsoft on optimizing their thread director so that's being utilized in the most effective way. I now look at eCores in a totally different light and this makes me a lot more excited and interested in the future developments for Intel's hybrid architecture and to see what they do in the future which will extract more performance out of it. But for now, that will do it for this one. I'll see you guys in the next one. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing. I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.